Welcome everyone uh, to um, our session today, this afternoon, entitled Cybersecurity of Civilian uh, Nuclear Infrastructure. Um, this session is being co-hosted by Chatham House, uh, as well as Microsoft uh, and uh, the University of Oxford. It's a real pleasure to be with you all today, both in person and online. Special thanks to all those of you who are joining uh, us from um, different time zones, especially six or seven hours behind, especially our online speakers. Thanks so much for, for joining us, for being with us today. Um, and um, what I'm gonna do in two and a half minutes is really uh, go through our run of show to take you through what we're gonna uh, cover today and introduce our brilliant, our stellar lineup of speakers uh, for this afternoon. Um, my name is Talita Diaz. I am the Senior Research Fellow on the International Program at Chatham House. Um, and this session is being co-hosted um, with my brilliant colleague, Rowan Wilkinson, who is sitting by my side, who is the Program Assistant at Chatham House's Digital Society Initiative and the International Law Program, who is an expert in tech policy. And um, what I want to do now is talk a little bit about this topic, to give you a little bit of an overview, to set the scene, and to really speak to the importance of why we are here today. And um, this session is really about the convergence of cyber and nuclear risks. So we have on the one hand, uh, an increasing number of uh, malicious cyber operations of all kinds, uh, all shapes and forms, targeting all types of infrastructure, including critical infrastructure like the healthcare sector, the energy sector. And at the same time, we have long-standing nuclear risks that have been around since nuclear energy has been around. And so when the two come together, that poses a significant threat to national security as well as to global stability. And cyber attacks against uh, civilian and military nuclear systems, though our focus is on civilian infrastructure, they have been reported in different parts of the world, both developing and developed countries. So we all heard about what happened in Iran with Stuxnet or Olympic Games. Uh, that was probably the most widely reported cyber attack against a nuclear facility. But there were also cyber attacks against different kinds of cyber attacks against different kinds of nuclear facilities in India, North and South Korea, Norway, Germany, the United States, and now Ukraine. And even the International Atomic Energy Agency has been the target of malicious cyber operations. And the actual and the potential risks of these attacks, they include the extraction of sensitive information about nuclear capabilities, malfunctioning of equipment, as was the case with Stuxnet in Ukraine, disruption of energy supplies, or of places that are supplied by nuclear energy, increased radiation levels, which is very concerning, and potentially disastrous consequences of nuclear accidents for human lives, for health, and for the environment. These risks have now been amplified with the push for green energy, with the spread of what we call modular or small modular reactors and micro reactors, the use of nuclear energy, including these small reactors to power AI, as well as the use of AI to automate and diversify the different types of cyber operations against different targets, including critical infrastructure and potentially nuclear infrastructure. So we're gonna talk about this in more detail during the session, I hope so. But these operations, they include disruptive cyber operations uh, that might affect the operation of software and hardware. They include data surveillance or data gathering operations as well as information operations like misinformation and disinformation. Now, for many of you, the film Oppenheimer might have sort of uh, resurrected some of those fears of uh, nuclear threat and nuclear holocaust. For me personally, being in Japan and having had the opportunity to visit Hiroshima has been a real life changing moment and just highlights for me the importance of what we are discussing today. 
and the kinds of threats that we are facing, that humanity is facing. So Chatham House uh, is worried about these risks. So is Microsoft, so is the University of Oxford. And so Chatham House has done work in the past from an international security perspective on the risks, uh, the cybersecurity risks against uh, civilian and both and military nuclear infrastructure. We are at the moment carrying out a project on this topic, on this exact topic, focusing on international law and norms. And so this session will explore uh, in more detail these, these issues, including in particular, in particular international technical standards, rules and principles of international law, and non-binding norms of responsible state behavior that protect the cybersecurity of civilian nuclear infrastructure. So the session will be divided into three parts, uh, or we'll have three segments. The first one will be an in-conversation session with um, Marion Mesmer, who is uh, speaking online from London. Uh, she's a senior research fellow on the International Security Program at Chatham House. She's an expert in arms control and nuclear weapons policy issues. Um, we're gonna talk about cybersecurity risks and the consequences facing civilian nuclear facilities. Then in the second part of our session, we're going to have a discussion with Tarek Rauf, who was head of nuclear verification and security policy coordination at the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, with years of experience in nuclear disarmament, non-proliferation, and arms control, uh, as well as Giacomo Percy Paoli, also joining us online from Geneva, who is head of the security and technology program of UNIDIR the UN Institute for Disarmament Research, and he's an expert on the implications of emergency technologies for security and defense. Uh, and we'll also be joined by Michael Karimian, who is here in person with us, who is Director for Digital Diplomacy at Microsoft in the Asia Pacific region, uh, region with extensive expertise in human rights policy. Um, we're gonna talk about technical and policy approaches to protect a civilian nuclear infrastructure. From, cyb from cyber operations. And then we'll have a final section um, of our discussion, which will look at the legal and normative aspects of the issue. Uh, and for that, we'll have a chat with uh, Tomohiro Mikanagi, also in person here today, who is legal advisor of the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, and a partner fellow of the Laura Pact Center for International Law at Cambridge University, who has written extensively on cyber and international law. And also joining us online for this discussion is Priya Erz, Junior Research Fellow in Law at St. Jones College, Oxford, whose expertise spans across public international law, including cyber operations targeting critical infrastructure. Michael will also join us for this segment of, of, of the program. I'm gonna turn to Rowan for a few housekeeping uh, announcements. Rowan, over to you. Yeah, so um, hello, uh, good morning, afternoon evening, wherever you are. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, so yeah, just some brief housekeeping things. Uh, we're going to be running an interactive survey on Menti alongside this um, session. So we urge all people online and also in the room um, to scan the QR code when it comes up and, and please take part as we go along because we'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, and then at the end of the session, we're going to be having the usual Q&A. So for those in the room, we have the mics, so if you line up behind, if you have a question, and those in online, please just use the chat function. So, to kick us off with the first question. Yeah, so um, I actually wanted to show a video first, Rowan. Yeah. Um, so, technical team, would you mind putting up our slides so we can actually show a video that Chatham House has produced on this issue, um, just to give people an idea of what we're talking about today. Nuclear energy provides over 10% of the world's electricity and is highly reliable. Nuclear reactors work by using the energy produced in nuclear fission to heat water that turns into steam. The steam then drives a turbine to provide electricity that goes into the national grid. An advantage of nuclear energy is that it can reduce the reliance on fossil fuels 
and can help fight climate change. The energy that is produced by nuclear reactors is controlled for output and safety by sophisticated computers. But cyber attacks can interfere with these network computers, potentially shutting down power plants or causing other safety issues. A cyber attack using a computer worm called Stuxnet was used to disrupt Iran's nuclear enrichment program by interfering with the control systems for the centrifuges. So we need to put measures in place to protect nuclear plants against cyber attacks. Great, thanks. So I'm gonna turn over to Rowan who will kick us off with our survey, uh, actually, uh, to give a little bit of, of background to, to, to the topic and also get your views on what worries you the most when it comes to uh, cybersecurity of uh, civilian nuclear infrastructure. Rowan? Yes, yeah, so um, you can see on the screen, I'm just gonna put up the first um, question that we have for you all, um, which is when it comes, when you think about nuclear um, cybersecurity, what risks come to mind? Um, so yeah, please feel free to scan the QR code or you can enter the code um, to join the room and we'll, um, we'll see what you all have to say. I'll give, I'll give about, about a minute and a half or so just, just for people to answer. So really, what, what do you think about when we talk about this issue? And, and we really want to get your views on, 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 on what is most concerning for you. Because sometimes it's not obvious when we talk about, it can be a very technical or, or sometimes an intimidatingly technical topic. So we want to get your views on what worries you the most when you think about cyber and nuclear. Should we, should we have a look at the responses that we've had yeah. so far? Cool. <laughs> okay, wow, okay. So we've got radiation, radiation, environmental disaster, a significant loss of life and long-term radiological fallout. Owen? We've also got reputation, reputational harm to institutions, um, environmental destruction. Um, we've got security failures in IT networks of the nuclear plants which leads to disastrous outcomes, um, which I suppose links a bit to the one before about radiation. So, we, yeah, a wide range of harms, as you can see here. So to discuss or to delve deeper into, into those harms, we'll have a chat with Marion uh, online, uh, joining us from London. Uh, so Marion, let's talk about cybersecurity risks and consequences uh, facing uh, civilian nuclear facilities. So, uh, welcome. Hi, everyone. Good to be here. Great. Thanks, Marion, for joining us so early for you. So, first question I have for you, Marion, is what types of cyber operations have targeted or can target civilian nuclear systems? So, broadly speaking, um, I think it's really important to remember that there isn't just one type of cyber operation or cyber harm that could target um, civilian nuclear facilities. Because, um, as you already mentioned in your introduction, they could become targets for different reasons. So they could be targeted because they are specifically um, part of a nuclear system or nuclear network. And so um, perhaps the theft of specific um, nuclear related information is the goal of the attack, or they could be targeted because they produce energy and they, they are an important backbone of the national grid or of a country's power supply. So, um, so you know, you could imagine a whole range of scenarios in which they are targeted either purposefully or where they actually become collateral damage of some sort of other attack. Um, you already mentioned some of some of the examples that we've seen. Um, where nuclear power plants um, or other aspects of civilian nuclear infrastructure were targeted. And um, 
And I think what's what's really interesting about this conversation about cybersecurity and um, nuclear infrastructure is that when we first began to worry about cybersecurity, because a lot of existing operating nuclear power plants um, are older or perhaps um, you know have very bespoke, very purpose um, designed um, IT infrastructure, people originally thought that maybe this was a risk that they didn't have to worry about so much. So there was this idea that uh, maybe nuclear operators would be, would be safe because the IT infrastructure that they're using is, um, is so specific or is so unique. Whereas what we've seen over time is that um, as nuclear power plants, um, you know, have had to evolve, have had to update their systems, or as new nuclear power plants have come online, a lot more of the IT infrastructure is also off the shelf or is the same as that of other systems. And then um, you are in an environment where nuclear operators all of a sudden also have to think about cybersecurity and um, the, the aspects of IT security that they previously didn't have to worry about so much. So there was a bit of a uh, catch up that had to take place in the nuclear energy sector, where operators had to think about new regulations, new training procedures. Um, and um, that's really interesting to me, because it's, of course, a sector where physical safety and security has been so paramount for a long time. So um, now that we also need to think about cybersecurity, um, that can change the game a bit. And I think that worried a few people quite a lot when that first emerged as a possible risk. Thank you, Marin. And there are also the risks to hardware, right? To physical components of 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 of, uh, of what we call cyberspace, right? So it's not just uh, software risks, say a hacker hacking into the system, but also like there's human failure that might lead to. Uh, say, a breach in the hardware system of, of a power plant. So that's exactly what happened or uh, allegedly what happened with Stuxnet, for example. So great. So my second question to you is, um, to what extent have new developments in the nuclear sector uh, or in particular in the nuclear energy sector, such as the spread of small modular reactors, and micro reactors, which I've mentioned earlier, uh, to what extent have these developments increased those risks that you have just discussed? Yeah, so I, I think these developments um, pose both a risk and an opportunity. So, you know, if, if I had to say it simply, then having more systems increases the risk just by virtue of the fact that there are more reactors out there. Um, that's that's one aspect where the risk is coming from. Um, small modular reactors and micro reactors are specifically designed to be more accessible. And the hope is that they will be able to help, um, you know, bring a more stable power supply to perhaps regions of the world where that's currently not possible or very remote areas or areas where it's really difficult to have um, to have a stable infrastructure network for other reasons, perhaps because of remoteness, perhaps because of geography. So, um, so that's, of course, a huge chance. But at the same time, that also means that if you multiply the number of reactors that exist around the world, you, of course, also increase the risk of something going wrong. Um, the other concern about some of these reactors is that because they are developed by many different commercial actors, um, when I was preparing for this, I, I tried to figure out what the most accurate number is at the moment. And um, the IAEA estimates that at the moment around 80 different reactor designs are, or small modular reactor designs are being considered by different kinds of commercial actors. Um, there are concerns about the supply chain security. So um, you, of course, have a situation where uh, different components for um, the reactor or the steering modules or whatever you need in order to put this together are being developed um, by lots of different commercial entities and um, and in order to ensure the highest standards of cybersecurity, you also need to have quite a good understanding of that supply chain and where some of those um, where some of those security risks might come in. So uh, that's that's another concern that just because of the length of the supply chain, the diversity of the supply chain, and the numbers of different actors involved, um, it might be hard in the end to, to trace where some of uh, those risks might come in. And uh, then the other component, I think, where it introduces um, 
some newer risks or might actually highlight risks that already exist, um, but just multiply them, is that, as, as I mentioned when I spoke about the use cases, um, a lot of these use cases can be in quite difficult operating environments, or they can be um, perhaps in regions that are already less well off and therefore perhaps have, have less money to spend on cybersecurity. Um, so that's, of course, a risk that, you know, systems in that region would already be facing, but you then just combine that with the additional risk of, um, of nuclear energy. So, um, um, and then generally speaking, what I mentioned earlier about this um, tension between sometimes a really bespoke or unique system also being just a tad more secure because, um, because perhaps it has fewer vulnerabilities or the existing vulnerabilities will be less enticing to exploit. Um, these um, small modular reactors and micro reactors will of course have completely up-to-date software solutions and in many cases off the shelf software solutions. So if there are any vulnerabilities um, that we're not aware of, then they would of course be there as well. Um, but for the advantages opportunities, um, these newer reactors are designed differently. So in some cases they are already, um, like the nuclear aspect is already safer by design than it would have been in some older power plants. So that's of course one advantage. And the same also goes for the cybersecurity considerations. So because the awareness of uh, cybersecurity in those systems is much more advanced now than it was even five years ago, or certainly 10 years ago, 15 years ago, um, they, um, there are already much more considerations about cybersecurity in the design and then in the training of potential operators. So um, of course, we need to be vigilant and, you know, in part, we're having this panel because the cybersecurity conversation for um, nuclear uh, civilian infrastructure needs to go farther. But at the same time, um, I think we shouldn't let that forget us about um, the opportunities that come with some of these new developments as well. Great. Thanks, Mayor. And so there are both challenges and there are opportunities. And one issue that we will touch on uh, in this panel uh, later is the, the question of regulation, right? And you've mentioned the spread of these reactors in different parts of the world. But of course, we don't know how, you know, different states regulate the acquisition and the operation of these uh, small modular reactors. So that's probably also a risk that we need to be aware of. Now, pivoting to from, from peacetime to wartime, and I know that the war in Ukraine is on every one's minds at the moment it should be uh, not just the situation in Gaza H hopefully we we haven't forgotten about that so I want to talk about uh, the new and existing risks against civilian nuclear infrastructure that have resurfaced in the context of the war are there any particular risks that we need to be worried about because of the war Marion um, I mean what we've seen happen around um, the Saporizhia power plant in Ukraine has, of course, been horrendous. And I think one of the really new things there, or maybe maybe not new, but rare occurrences, is of a nuclear power plant being caught directly in war and directly being on the front line. Um, so the combination of a physical and cyber attacks taking place at the same time is something you know that I suppose we were worried about. Um, but that luckily doesn't happen all that often. So um, the personnel at uh, the Saporizhia plant has been incredibly dedicated. Um, many of them have stayed in place despite the risks to their own lives, but the power plant has had to operate with reduced personnel on site um, who are of course now working under much more stressful conditions um, and much more uncertain conditions. And so um, I think the combination of there being physical attacks that are very regular over a prolonged period of time, um, at certain points in time being quite constant, and then also having to worry about cyber attacks at the same time, um, which of course have taken place all over Ukraine with regularity, um, has created a particularly difficult to manage environment. Um, the, you know, the, the results of that could be, we have, we've not seen that um, so far, of course, and uh, the IAEA has also done it's best to support the personnel operating the power plant to ensure that everyone can stay safe and um, and that the running um, of or the, the management of the power plant, I should say, can continue safely. Um, so um, while I would say that some of the biggest risks probably 
were in place early on in the conflict when the um, reactors at Saporija were still running. They have now um, all been in some type of shutdown for the past several months. So that, of course, you know, uh, mitigates the risk significantly. Um, one of the things about nuclear reactors is that you can't turn them completely on or off um, immediately because the, some of the nuclear reaction continues on, um, which is why I'm talking about different types of shutdown. But um, five of the six reactors have been in cold shutdown for several months now. And then there is um, a sixth reactor which has been in hot shutdown because um, they've had to use some aspects of, um, of the reactor for safety operations. Um, but the IAEA has monitored you know, all, all of that and, and has tried to support the personnel at the power plant. So what we have been worried about, um, specifically with Saporizhia and specifically early on in the war, is um, that a potential loss of power or disconnection from the grid could um, interfere with the cooling system for the reactor. So that's when you could get into a reactor meltdown situation, um, which could, of course, have devastating consequences. Um, so uh, yeah, there were various mitigating steps taken to make sure that those risks were managed a little better, such as ensuring that there were plenty of um, backup generators on site so that cooling could still take place. Thanks, thanks, Marion. So um, I'll pause the um, uh, the chat with Marion for for a second because we want to hear your views on this. Um, and so Rowan, over to you. Yeah. So we have the next question um, on the mentee. So. Bearing in mind what you've just heard, um, thinking about both stable and um, insta and con context of instability, um, why should we be worried about cyber operations targeting civilian nuclear infrastructure? And for those of you that have just joined um, the session, please um, feel free to take part in the polls that we're running um, because we'd love to hear your views on this topic. Sorry, we seem to be having a problem with that one. So um, I think we'll leave that one for today. Yeah, or maybe go back to it <laughs> later. Or maybe go back to it, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Marion, uh, back to you. Now, um, since we're talking about risks and what we should be worried about, um, what are the likelihood, what is the actual likelihood of all these risks that we have been discussing on the environment, on lives of individuals, on health? Uh, on uh, reputational harm of international institutions, uh, um, equipment malfunctioning. What is the actual likelihood of, of, of these risks materializing? And a related question is, what would be the consequences? Uh, you know, concretely, what would be the consequences? Do you agree with the, the, what you know, the, the, with, with, with the responses that have been provided in the in the previous? question uh, about the consequences of those risks materializing, for example, on health, environment, and the international system. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, it's really hard to say how likely it is that, uh, that those risks might materialize. I think what's important is that the consequences could be severe, and so we have to take the risks seriously, and we have to do our best to mitigate those risks. Um, as I already mentioned a little in my previous answer, um, in the Saporizhia case especially, um, while of course there is still a risk there, um, for the time being, I'm a little reassured by the, the accident safety operations um, that, that are taking place there, um, and also by you know, some of the other mitigating steps that have been taken. Um, the other thing I would also say in that regard is that we heard a lot, especially early on um, in the war, that you know, Zaporizhia could lead to the next uh, Chernobyl, and um, that there is a significant difference in how the reactors are designed at Zaporizhia versus at Chernobyl. That would actually make that outcome less likely. So. Um, I'm not trying to say people should be complacent. Um, these risks are very severe. And if something was to happen, then that would have really grave consequences. So we need to be vigilant. But you know, in terms of people being overly worried or you know, seeing another 
a Chernobyl type situation on the horizon. I think there are reasons why that is less likely um, than people might have feared. And the other thing I would say is that as you know, uh, as you mentioned in your introduction, we're hoping that nuclear energy can play a really important role in the energy transition, in moving towards net zero, and in ensuring that we've got a more stable energy supply while we are trying to figure out, um, you know, sustainable and renewable um, types of energy, so that we can hopefully. Um, slow or halt climate change. And um, what really worries me in that regard is that um, what we have seen in Ukraine, this combination of, uh, of nuclear power plants being caught in conflict could actually happen more frequently around the globe. Because if more countries end up using nuclear energy as, um, as an important part of their energy supply, and you know, you also mentioned the increasing frequency of cyber attacks, then I think this unique combination of a um, power plant or other types of energy infrastructure being caught in conflict might become a much more frequent occurrence. So if we can think about now what we can do to, ma to manage that situation for the future, then uh, that's going to leave all of us much better off. Thank you, Marion. Um, now, to to summarize or to get your views on, on uh, what we just discussed in this segment of our panel, we will go back to Menti. Uh, with a with a survey this time, hopefully it will work. <laughs> Rowan, <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. I think we've uh, we've fixed it now. Um, so this one is uh, about the risks that we've just heard. Um, so we're wondering which of these risks worries you the most. So we have um, some five different options here for you to choose from. Um, so picking your kind of priority option, um, we've got disruptive cyber operations. For example, a ransomware attacks, um, distributed denial of service attacks. Uh, we've got information operations like uh, disinformation, misinformation. Propaganda, propaganda misinformation, revolving around nuclear energy, which you know have uh, mm -hmm. occurred in the context of Ukraine. For example, we've also got data gathering or surveillance operations. So basically. Solar winds, for example, operations that try and, and, and get uh, access to sensitive nuclear data. We've got physical effects of these operations, for example, as what happened with Stuxnet in Ukraine. So lots of centrifuges were stopped working. Um, and as Marion said, there is a risk of a, of a new ch Chernobyl, of a, a cyber-generated Chernobyl, uh, even though that risk might be more remote now. Uh, and we've got non-physical effects that we have discussed uh, already, such as um, effects uh, on the reputation of the international system. Um, and also, going back to physical effects, we can't forget about health uh, and the environment. So yeah. just just uh, vote there. We want to we want to see what you what you think. And as Michael just reminded me, there's also the psychological effects of, of, of information operations. Well, the fear of nuclear holocaust and war as well. That's a good one. Yeah, ready? Okay, so let's see what you voted on. Let's see the results of this. Okay, so everyone, so most people are worried uh, the most about physical effects. That's what yeah. I answered. Which, yeah. which makes sense given that at the beginning, a lot of people mentioned yeah. radiation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, disruptive cyber operations, I think that's because they carry the most risk of, you know, of interrupting the energy supply, for example, or destroying power plants, for example. Information operations comes in third place, data gathering operations in fourth, and the non-physical effects come in, in the fifth place. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Go, we'll, we'll keep that in mind. 
Uh, so moving on to the second, and thank you, Marion, so much again for joining us so early for you. It was great. Um, so let's move to the second part of our panel, uh, which is about technical and policy approaches to protect civilian nuclear infrastructure from cyber operations. For that, we have a conversation with Tarek Rove, former um, uh, IEAE. Uh, we've got Giacomo Paoli at Unidare, and we've got Michael Karimian at Microsoft here. So I'm going to start with a question for Tarek. Tarek, do we have any international technical standards on how to mitigate those risks and consequences that we have been talking about? Well, yes, at the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, cybersecurity, which is usually referred to here as computer security of nuclear facilities and nuclear materials, is considered being a subset of nuclear security. And nuclear security is the responsibility of the state and the operator. And while there are international conventions, such as the Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material as amended, the primary responsibility still remains with the state and the operator. And the IAEA has issued more than 30 documents on um, guidance, recommendations, and fundamentals of nuclear security. And there is a parallel sub-series of uh, guidance and recommendations on enhancing um, cybersecurity or, or computer security. And in the discussions here, uh, cybersecurity or computer security also has implications for nuclear safety. So there are two aspects to it, not only the security of the facility and the material and the integrity of the instrument control uh, system, but also the safety of the nuclear facility, because as we discussed a little bit in the first session, we are dealing with uh, radioactive uh, materials and uh, containment of reactivity or release of radioactivity from an operating or a shutdown nuclear facility is one of the highest uh, uh, objectives of nuclear safety. There's also consideration of ensuring that the heat removal and the cooling system of a nuclear reactor, whether in operating status or shutdown, uh, is uh, not compromised. And then also there is the confinement and control of nuclear material whether in spent fuel bundles uh, in cooling ponds or nuclear fuel bundles stored inside the reactor that are cooling down, uh, and then also the fuel in a reactor itself. Uh, one important element here is to ensure that there is no loss of coolant. There has been at least one incident where it is suspected that because of a malicious cyber attack, uh, some coolant was uh, leaked from an operating nuclear facility, but the uh, uh, control room managed to detect it early on, and they shut off the pump uh, that was uh, discharging water from uh, the cooling system. Um, later on, I can give you more details about specific IEA documentation and guidance. Great, Thank, thanks, Derek. I can see that there are some uh, comments or, or questions uh, in the chat, and I want this to be as interactive as possible. So maybe we should take the questions now. Um, uh, so uh, apologies for mispronouncing the name in advance. So Tumi um, is saying he thinks that the reuse of old submarines and add SMRs, I'm not sure what that means, but maybe... Um, Okay, small modular uh, reactors. Okay, great. To generate electricity permanently under the sea, uh, we'll be able to isolate ourselves from problems on land. And then Tyrell says that's a great idea. Um, what do you think? Uh, uh, Tarek uh, or maybe Marion, do you want to uh, come in and comment on that? Um, I know it's bringing the Q&A to the that. session. So yeah. we do have a, a floating reactor that is operating uh, in the Russian north. Uh, this is actually a modified reactor from a nuclear propulsion unit of uh, Icebreaker. Um, there are uh, nuclear-powered submarines, but at the moment there is no consideration of using submerged uh, small uh, and medium-sized reactors for power generation. All of the designs that were referred to, there are about 80 designs that are currently under discussion, of which 
about three are uh, close to maturity for uh, testing, first of a kind, but these are all uh, land-based. Now, one advantage of SMRs and MMRs is that these are sealed reactor units as compared to large nuclear power plants, which need to be refueled uh, partially or completely every year or every few years. So that is one uh, inherent inbuilt safety consideration for SMRs and MMRs. But nonetheless, uh, one needs to ensure that the integrity of the instrument control system and regulation of the reactor itself is not compromised. The inst instances that have occurred of compromise usually have, have been through back doors, <clears throat> either left open by contractors so that they could do the servicing sitting at home or from their office, or uh, inadvertent back doors that were created through the use of uh, USB sticks uh, that were inserted into some part of the computer system and the facility, although this is strictly prohibited not to bring in any outside USB sticks or other um, data uh, carrying devices and to uh, insert them into uh, the computer systems of, of nuclear facilities. At least in theory. <laughs> okay, Marion, do you want to comment on that or should we move on? Um, I can just add one, one bit because um, uh, what I wanted to say is that, you know, it, even if it seems tempting to, for example, um, put small modular reactors or other types of reactors um, underwater to have them away from land. Uh, you have to remember that, of course, the ocean is also part of our ecosystem. So even if there was to be a radiological incident underwater, that would still have pretty severe consequences for that environment. And, um, and the water will, of course, mix. So the radiation would still spread. So while it wouldn't be the same kind of fallout that we would get um, if it was in air, um, it's not like it's just out of sight, out of mind in that sense, because it's underwater. Yeah, we, we, we also drink some of the water that comes from the sea. So um, uh, that's that's a very important point, uh, Marion. Uh, so I want to go back to Tarek. Um, and I want you, Tarek, if you can, to take us a little bit um, through the, the, the IT security guidance for nuclear facilities that the IAEA has produced for member states uh, that have operational nuclear, nuclear power plants or nuclear fuel cycle facilities. Can you talk us a little bit, talk to us a little bit more about these uh, documents, these over 30 documents that, that the agency has issued? Mm -hmm. So um, the way the IAEA is approaching this, and this is in cooperation with IAEA member states. So this is not just the bureaucracy of the International Atomic Energy Agency that is producing these, uh, this guidance or recommendations. They do it in concert with technical experts from the IAEA's 176 uh, member states, those that are interested. And this is an interactive process between uh, the technical experts of member states and the experts of the IAEA secretariat. And jointly, they... Um, draft and produce these documents, which then once they are approved, become the guidance recommendations or, or fundamentals. So computer security measures um, in the context of cybersecurity for nuclear facilities as discussed and considered at the IAEA are to prevent, detect, delay, and respond to criminal or other intentional or unauthorized attacks. Then to mitigate the consequences of such attacks, and to recover from the consequences of such attacks. Um, so computer security measures can be assigned to one of three categories, technical control measures, facility control measures, or administrative uh, control measures. So the agency has been actively involved in developing these and they've come up with a taxonomy, uh, which is number one, defense in depth. This is having a defense in depth approach to cybersecurity with multiple layers of security controls and measures to protect nuclear facilities, including physical security, network security, access controls and monitoring. Also risk assessment that nuclear facilities should conduct a comprehensive cybersecurity risk assessment to identify potential vulnerabilities and threats. And then this assessment forms the basis for developing appropriate security measures to institute, this is number three, to institute security policies and procedures 
which is to establish and implement cybersecurity policies and procedures tailored to the specific needs of specific nuclear facilities. This is called design basis threat, uh, designing um, security policies and measures specific to a particular nuclear facility, its uh, technological peculiarities, and the risks that that particular facility might face. Uh, then, of course, there are obvious things such as access control, network security, patch management, uh, incident detection and response. This is a increasingly important element. As you mentioned in your introduction, the IAEA is subjected to daily uh, cyber attacks on its system uh, from different sources. Some are trying to access the highly confidential safeguards information. Some are, are just opportunistic attacks. And my colleagues, uh, my, my colleagues at the IAEA uh, in the IT sector, this is their biggest challenge, is to make sure that there is no um, uh, intrusion into the IAEA's computer uh, security system. And they are very proud that they have managed to detect and to counter uh, any of these uh, potential attacks on the system. But this is, uh, we say nuclear security is not an end, it's a journey. So cybersecurity is also the same as the threats are evolving, the responses also need to uh, uh, evolve, so to speak. Then there's also, of course, encryption, physical security. Uh, an important element is also to do security audits and assessments on a continuous basis to see if there are new vulnerabilities that have come in, supply chain vulnerabilities. Uh, other important issues are information sharing, international cooperation, training and awareness, and then capacity building. And this is one of the IAEA's uh, uh, biggest activities. Every year, the IAEA holds uh, hundreds of uh, sessions, both at headquarters here in Vienna and in different cities to build capacity to strengthen uh, the capacity and the training of uh, nuclear facility operators. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Tarek, is there anything else that you want to uh, comment about the, the guidance? Um, um, I would, uh, you sent me some questions, so I will come back when you get to the <laughs> okay. next question where, where I can cite some of the specific uh, IAEA documentation, which is all available freely uh, on the internet. It's not password control and people can download the PDFs. Uh, a lot of this is quite technical, but it's all up there. Great, thanks. So you've mentioned a lot of guidance, uh, a, a comprehensive range of, 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 of best practices from every step of the way of, of nuclear cybersecurity, from design to implementation to risk uh, mitigation and so on and so forth. But all of those guidances, as the name suggests, uh, uh, they are non-binding guidances. They are documents that are not uh, mandatory for states, right? But I want to ask you um, if any of those measures that have been proposed or recommended by the IAEA have been adopted by the Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material, which is a binding document under international law. Well, this unfortunately is the situation when we are dealing with sovereign states. So the Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material as amended is only binding on those states that have acceded to it, unfortunately. It's not universal international law that if a country has nuclear material and nuclear facilities, it must be a party to the CPPNM. So the way around it is that those countries that have signed on to it, for them, it is internationally legally binding. Now, the amendment to the CPPNM, which took place uh, in 2005, was more to extend the scope of the CPPNM to cover nuclear material in peaceful uses, in domestic storage, and in international transport. But unfortunately, state parties were not able to agree on the application of the CPPNM to military nuclear material. And as you know, we have had five nuclear security summits. People only remember four of them, the ones that started in 2010 in Washington, but the very first one was in 1996. So 83% of the world's 
dangerous nuclear material that is highly enriched uranium and plutonium is in the custody of the nine countries with nuclear weapons. And it is completely outside of any international accountability or monitoring. Only 17% of the material is under International Atomic Energy Agency safeguards. And as part of the safeguards agreement of a state with the IAEA, physical security and safety is obligatory. And then as we just mentioned, uh, cybersecurity being a subset of nuclear security is also uh, something that the state needs to implement. So even after the Fukushima accident, there were attempts to make the CPPNM mandatory and compulsory for the, all of the 31 states that operate nuclear facilities. At the moment, only Iran remains outside, a country that has an operating nuclear power plant that has not yet exceeded uh, to uh, the CPPNM as amended and also not to the Convention on Nuclear Safety. Um, so this again is the tussle between protection of national sovereignty and on the other hand, uh, protecting against cyber and other malicious attacks because the effects of those will be transboundary. They will not be limited to the territory of the affected or the accident state. Uh, as Chernobyl showed, as Fukushima showed, we have transboundary transport of radiation, and that is the biggest concern as regards a disruptive cyber attack on a nuclear facility that results in the release of radioactivity. Thanks, Derek. And effects that stretch in time as well, because even this year we've had issues about uh, the disposal of water from, from Fukushima. Uh, thank, th thanks for, for clarifying the scope of, of, of the convention. And I guess what you said just highlights the importance of international law and strengthening international law and discussions that might lead to new norms and rules uh, on this issue. Uh, I'm going to uh, turn over to Rowan just for another question for everyone here. Uh, in the audience and online. Uh, so based on what we have just heard from Tarek, in your opinion... Yeah, so in your opinion, um, should there be enhanced interaction and cooperation on cybersecurity between agencies like the IAEA and also the tech industry? We'll give a little bit of time just to just as people come into it. So I guess that's a clear <laughs> uh, unanimity here on, on yes, right? Um, and, and Michael will come back to this point about um, cooperation or, or the role of the tech industry uh, to, to tackle uh, all of these issues that we've been discussing. But now on, uh, so Tarek mentioned state sovereignty. He also talked a little bit about uh, international law, the role of um, the Convention on Physical Protection of Nuclear Material. Um, and I've mentioned the, the need for, for states to be discussing this issue more often. So I wanna turn to Giacomo who is joining us from Geneva. Hi, Giacomo. Um, Hi, good morning. <laughs> and I, I want to ask you, how has the protection of critical infrastructure been discussed in the context of the open-ended working group on the security of information and communications technologies, also known as the UN OEWG? Thank you. Thank you, Tadita, for the question. And thank you also for inviting me. It's, it's great to be able to participate in this great panel. Um, so. Let me give you like a, a, a 30 second summary of 25 years of history before I get specifically into the, uh, the question. Uh, but I think this summary is useful, particularly to those in the audience that may not be too familiar with the, the various UN processes and the jargon that is associated with them. So states have been discussing about international cybersecurity, I would say, for, actually this year is the 25th anniversary since the first draft resolution on this topic was put on the table. Uh, at the time by the Russian Federation in 1998. Since then, we had six iterations of a process called the Group of Governmental Experts. Now, this is a closed door uh, uh, process that on average involves about 
20 uh, countries, uh, of which five are always the P5, and the five permanent members of the uh, Security Council, and then others are, are invited to join. The specificity about this process is that the only public thing that exists, public trace, is the mandate that sets up the process and the report at the end of it, which means that there isn't really a lot of visibility as to what the discussions uh, actually are. And if states do not agree you know, on a consensus report at the end of it, the, the report that we have at the end of the of the deliberations, it's a very procedural one that says, you know, we came, we met, we didn't agree, move on. Um, now, the situation started to change in uh, 2019, where in parallel with the last, uh, uh, at least to date, uh, um, group of governmental experts, another process was set up, the open-ended working group. Now, the open-ended working group is open to all membership of the UN. It has a uh, a, a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, component to it as well, but most importantly, it's all public. So all statements that are made can be consulted online, all sessions can be followed on, on UN TV, and you know, the chair has the opportunity, even if there isn't a consensus report, to publish its own, its own or her own summary. So there is definitely more visibility in the actual uh, workings of the process. Coming to your question, I think it's important to, to realize that um, you know, one of the most significant achievements that states collectively uh, uh, had uh, is data since 20, 2015 when a uh, framework for responsible state behavior in cyberspace was adopted. And as part of this framework, there are 11 norms. The topic of critical infrastructure is probably the topic that features you know, the most, uh, either directly or, or indirectly, you know, three of these 11 norms focus on the topic of critical infrastructure, whether it is to uh, basically call states to, to protect their critical infrastructure, um, whether it is, you know, calling states to not target critical infrastructure of others. And then there is a dedicated norm that focuses on uh, ensuring that international assistance is provided to those states whose critical infrastructure is being targeted by cyber attacks. Now, these three norms have an explicit reference to critical infrastructure, and there are uh, a whole set of others which are more indirect related, particularly related to vulnerability disclosure or uh, supply chain security. You can see how some of these topics may be indirectly relevant to uh, um, critical infrastructure protection as well. Um, I'm probably bridging to, to the next question here, but by, by design, these, uh, these norms, and until very recently, I didn't really go too much into the detail of which type of, of critical infrastructure. The OEWG is probably not the, the correct forum to have in-depth discussion as to how each of these general purpose norms applies to specific sectors or specific uh, um, type of infrastructure. However, it is definitely a topic that is being uh, discussed quite extensively, both in relation to how the threats are evolving, in relation to how norms can be implemented, as well as what could be some of the uh, um, consequences from an international law perspective. Thanks, Giacomo. So, um, in your opinion, it, it's not the, the best forum to discuss specific risks to particular types of critical infrastructure, but um, to your mind, and you've been, you know, deeply involved in this process as part of UNIDIR, um, and, and, and does it come to mind uh, that any state has specifically raised the issue of, of uh, cyber nuclear risks within the OEWG or perhaps other UN forums? Can mm -hmm. you can you remember if any state has ever raised this issue? So it's a, it's a very interesting question because if you look uh, uh, at the consensus reports, um, we couldn't really find any explicit reference to nuclear uh, itself in the consensus reports. Um, however, uh, the discussion is, you know, is, is evolving states individually in their national submissions to the Secretary General that then compiles uh, all of these submissions and uh, releases a, a report 
did flag uh, uh, you know, the nuclear security issue characterized in different ways, whether it is uh, more, again, uh, expressing growing concern over the threats that cyber capabilities and cyber operations can pose to uh, civilian nuclear infrastructure, so more on the threat side, or to highlight some of the efforts that they've put in place at the national level to protect kind of their nuclear infrastructure as part of uh, um, kind of wider interventions. Um, you know, some, some states have dedicated, you know, uh, uh, national cybersecurity strategies that have been designed and dedicated specifically to protect their, their nuclear infrastructure. So there is definitely a lot more uh, that is going on at the national level that is flagged on, you know, in the context of the OWG. But if you look at how the OWG uh, discussions have been evolving, they went from being very general, then, then you know, uh, in 2021, also as a result of, of the pandemic and uh, the sheer increase of cyber attacks that have characterized all sectors of society, including critical infrastructure, the report of the, of the OWG that concluded in 2021 did mention things explicitly critical infrastructure types such as medical infrastructure or energy or financial etc um, so we are going down the, the path of discussing these topics more broadly but my personal opinion my personal sense is that as long as there isn't a dedicated a forum for states to discuss implementation more than than a kind of normative framework, but actually the implementation of these uh, quite general purpose norms that have been designed. It's gonna be difficult for states to really uh, go deep into any uh, of, these, uh, of these topics, simply also because of matter of, of, of time uh, that they have available. Um, however, I think it is important to, to, uh, to acknowledge that the topic has been, despite not necessarily being captured in, in consensus reports, it is being flagged uh, uh, by an increasing number of states in their national capacity when they make their interventions. So maybe just a question of some of those states trying to bring the issue to, 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 the, uh, to the general uh, uh, fora that, that the UN offers for these discussions. And maybe we should take up your idea of having a, a sort of like a more concrete implementation focused um, um, forum for, for these discussions. Uh, thanks, Giacomo, uh, for, for your um, thoughts and for your input. I'm now going to turn over to uh, Michael and perhaps uh, maybe Giacomo and Tarek want to, to comment on this point, which is about the role of the tech industry in addressing those risks. So Michael, what is the role of the tech industry? You work for Microsoft. So what does Microsoft have to say about this? Thank you, Talita. Not just for being our moderator, but of course to yourself and the team at Chatham House for being essential partners uh, in the session and brought a project in the same to Priya from the University of Oxford. I'd like to underscore a couple of topics or key points, I guess, in this regard. One is that, of course, the tech sector broadly, and as Marion mentioned, there are, there are many companies who supply uh, ICT infrastructure to this industry that we're looking at. Of course, that the tech sector plays a, a central role in providing the digital solutions that underpin uh, quite a broad range of operations, safety and security of nuclear systems but also to be frank, just mundane, everyday processes and applications like payroll or accounts receivable. And so because of that, there are many entry points into the IT systems. And so the risks are, are, are quite broad. And as Marion mentioned, the supply chains are, are very deep. As we've been discussing, of course, there is this convergence of cyber and nuclear risks, which has this uh, quite serious, poses a quite serious threat to national security and global stability. So with that in mind, uh, I think it's important to recognize that as a provider of these systems, we have quite serious responsibilities accordingly. And so to address these risks effectively, the tech sector can and should, more broadly, take a number of proactive steps, including but not limited to, of course, cybersecurity by design. So prioritizing the cybersecurity of systems from the very inception uh, of their products and services and embedding security uh, into the design, development, and deployment of processes. And by doing so, that will go a long way to reducing vulnerabilities and uh, strengthen the overall resilience of nuclear systems. Continuous innovation is very important, as we've been discussing, the, the threat landscape 
is, is ever evolving, and therefore continuously innovating to stay ahead of cyber adversaries is essential. Uh, that requires actively researching, but also sharing threat intelligence to detect and respond to emerging risks, and doing that with governments, international organizations, and other stakeholders. So a degree of transparency and threat uh, sharing from the tech sector is also very important. Equally, education and training plays quite an important role. Tech companies can be pivotal uh, in educating and training end users and administrators of their technologies. So providing guidance on cybersecurity best practices is essential too. And of course, multi-stakeholder engagement has, has already come up as a, a topic in this uh, session so far, but collaboration is key to addressing uh, the complex challenges that we're discussing here today. And so the tech sector, big and small, should be quite actively engaging with governments, civil society, and other companies to jointly tackle the cybersecurity issues that we're talking about. We already do see initiatives that are doing that broadly, like the Cybersecurity Tech Accord, which promotes collaboration and protection of critical infrastructure. That's a prime example of these efforts, and we can delve into them more in this session. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, Giacomo uh, and Tarek, do you have any thoughts or comments or reactions to what Michael just said about the role of uh, the, the private sector in addressing those um, risks? Yep. Could I comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. So I completely agree what uh, Michael just said. Um, again, this is the issue of state sovereignty. So international organizations like the IAEA are based on interactions with states and, and not with other actors such as industry. However, this pattern is changing and more and more industry is being brought in to provide its expertise and experience in providing technological solutions uh, to these new problems. But a main challenge for an international organization like the International Atomic Energy Agency that is dealing with highly classified information about the nuclear activities of over 180 states is the risk of penetration into the system by state actors, not so much non-state actors, given the high politics involved. Uh, and Talita, you in your introduction uh, mentioned the cyber attacks on Iran's uh, enrichment facilities, uh, Stuxnet and Olympic Games. So those were state originated uh, threats. And those are still continuing because of high politics here. So I don't want to name states, but there are no innocent parties, so to speak. Anyone can be a threat for the IAEA's uh, computer security system at the agency here in, in, in Vienna. Uh, and then the IAEA has to buy uh, commercial products. So one product that the IAEA bought some time back was Palantir, which is to manage big data. The Palantir was originally developed for the intelligence agency. So an international organization's uh, IT experts will never be able to match the expertise and the capabilities of uh, offensive IT capabilities of, of states if they choose to deploy them. Uh, against the IEA. So there is this inbuilt suspicion, uh, which is one potential roadblock for the IEA uh, uh, interaction with uh, the industry beyond a certain level. And I think we need to overcome this and build more trust and build more patterns of cooperation and interactivity. Thanks, Tarek. Giacomo, um, one or two thoughts very quickly. Yes, conscious of the time. Very, very quickly, I, I can only agree with both Michael and Tariq here. I think it's, uh, uh, I think it's important that even uh, uh, in relation to, to what we're discussing with the AWG, um, this is, you know, the AWG covers state behavior. Um, you know, it's, it's discussed by states to regulate or guide their own behavior. It doesn't deal with threats uh, coming from non-state uh, actors, which can be significant. But I think the private sector here um, can play uh, a significant role um, in, in helping in states develop capacities, providing capabilities, public-private partnerships have been all, almost uh, at every single session flagged as uh, a way uh, forward that really needs to be investigated uh, as a general purpose tool to really increase cyber resilience of member states. And this includes also the energy sector and in particular the nuclear one. So absolutely, it is, it is key that we, we bring uh, the private sector along in the journey. 
Great. So multi-stakeholderism is a, is a recurring theme in this, in this Internet Governance Forum. And we also need it uh, to protect uh, civilian uh, nuclear facilities from, from cybersecurity threats. So, so that's, that's the main lesson. Um, that's the main takeaway from, from this discussion so far. So Michael, back to you. What best practices or recommendations have been developed by the tech sector, uh, the tech industry operating in the civ civilian nuclear sector, including Microsoft itself? So I'll speak on behalf of Microsoft and say that actually we haven't developed specific guidance to the tech for the uh, nuclear sector. The reason being, although the outcomes of the risks are differentiated, the underlying cybersecurity risks are almost universal. We see these same risks applying to all sectors uh, across the board. And it's surprising that there's sort of the sort of gaps that are out there. So 80% of incidents can be traced to uh, missing security practices, which can be solved by quite basic modern approaches. Over 90% of accounts which have been compromised by password-based attacks did not have multi-factor authentication or any strong authentication in place. According to a study, 78% of devices are not patched within nine months of a critical patch being released. And uh, the number of users who use multi-factor authentication is actually only around 26%, it, it's, it's pretty low. But what's interesting here is that attacks by nation state actors can be technically sophisticated. However, many of these actors use relatively low tech means such as spear phishing to, and other, other uh, um, uh, efforts to deliver quite sophisticated malware into uh, uh, the, the systems. And actually we mentioned the, the case in, in Germany, the case was mentioned about a USB stick. The, the case in, in Germany, as was publicly reported, was uh, the entry point there was a, a user brought in a, a USB stick and, and then uh, the rest is history, so to speak. So a lot of these issues can be mitigated by good yet basic cyber hygiene practices and that's meant to be holistic, adaptive and global in nature and a lot of that can happen better in the cloud than on-premises. So the general guidance which would apply to all sectors and include in this sector is to protect the identity of users, apply updates as soon as possible, use extended detection and response response anti-malware and endpoint detection solutions, and also to enable the auditing of key resources and, quite importantly, prepare incident response plans. That's actually very much aligned with the IAEA guidelines, which really speaks to the strength of the guidelines that they have produced. Thank you, Michael. So it's all a question of putting all of this together, you know, what the a, uh, IAA has already put out, what, uh, you know, the private sector has advised uh, operators to do, and also what states have also agreed to do or are willing to uh, to to agree in this in the sector. So I want to pivot to the third part or the third segment of our panel uh, today of our, our workshop today, which is about international law and norms. Uh, and um, we have um, for this segment Priya Urs. Uh, from Oxford, joining us online, and Tomohiro Mikanagi from the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and Michael will also join us for this discussion. Um, I'm, I've noticed that there are a couple of questions about international law, international legal regimes, agreements, so I'm going to take those questions later uh, from the chat and ask to our panelists uh, um, in this segment. But I want to start with uh, Priya and Tomo um, with a question, um, a very general question about the applicability of international law to all of those issues that we have been tackling today. So to what extent can a cyber operation that targets uh, civilian nuclear infrastructure breach existing rules of international law? Um, I don't know who wants to start, but m maybe Priya, because you're online and it's very early for you. Um, do you want to do you want to kick off? Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, it's been a fascinating discussion so far. I think what's um, tough when discussing international law in this context is that unlike the technical and policy guidance we've been talking about so far, international law doesn't yet have specific rules um, that prohibit or otherwise address cyber operations. And so even while states are increasingly recognizing, as we see, um, civilian nuclear infrastructure as part of what they call their critical infrastructure, um, which states suggest should be protected against cyber operations, um, this hasn't really translated into specific legal protections. Um, and so what we're left with, at least for now, is um, more general rules of international law that could be applicable in this context. Um, and this includes not just treaties, um, such as one we've already discussed um, with Tariq, uh, but also rules of customary international law, including rules governing the use of force by states, um, the rule uh, prohibiting intervention by one state in the affairs of another state, 
um, any other conduct that could also be prohibited as a consequence of a state's sovereignty over its territory. Um, and also, on the other hand, due diligence obligations for states. Um, and so maybe I'll just say for now that although none of these rules was actually designed with cyber operations in mind, and certainly not thinking of civilian nuclear infrastructure, uh, they can in principle be applicable to this context. But of course, the particular application could raise um, some challenges. So I'll leave it there for now. Thanks. So, Tom, do you want to address this question about uh, gen international law in general, but also a more specific question um, that I have for you on sovereignty? So, I know you've written a lot about cyber and international law. So, on top of the general sort of like landscape of international law applicable to this phenomenon, can you talk to us a little bit about the threshold for a violation of sovereignty? Uh, by a cyber operation affecting uh, critical infrastructure in general, and if that threshold for critical infrastructure in general differs for a nuclear infrastructure. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tarita and uh, Rowan, for inviting me to this uh, wonderful panel. This is a good experience uh, uh, for me to think about, you know, connection between cyber security and uh, nuclear security. Actually, in my uh, brain, these two <laughs> issues have not uh, well connected before, but this is a great opportunity to in, uh, think in depth uh, these issues. A uh, sovereignty issue is really a um, difficult issue uh, among international lawyers because of uh, different positions taken by uh, different countries. Uh, it is very already very famous that the United Kingdom takes rather a uh, specific position that uh, they don't think there's any standalone uh, obligation arising from the sovereignty, apart from the non-intervention rule into the internal or external affairs of states. That, that is uh, not supported by many states, I must say, but th that is a very strong position expressed by the United Kingdom. And the other extremes are probably uh, it, uh, position is taken by France. France is saying that uh, any effect caused by cyber operation in the territory of the country would amount to a violation of sovereignty. Uh, in between, there are several other countries like uh, US, Germany, Netherlands, and maybe Japan is also a part of this uh, group, which uh, set certain level of a harmful effect caused in the uh, territory that would amount to the violation of uh, sovereignty or territorial integrity of the state. But there's no consensus. But I think there's a general uh, tendency or agreement, uh, I must say, that the more uh, serious the effect of the cyber operation, uh, the more uh, likelier for states to accept that is unlawful under the rules of uh, violation of sovereignty. So I, I think, you know, uh, nuclear, uh, you know, uh, cyber operations targeting nuclear facilities are more uh, likelier to cause more harmful effect. If that is the case, the states should be able to agree on the unlawfulness of the, that kind of uh, particular kind of uh, cyber operations to be unlawful. But th this does not necessarily mean there's a lower threshold for nuclear you know, uh, attack, uh, cyber attack against nuclear facilities. Rather, nuclear you know, uh, uh, facilities are more vulnerable and more, uh, I think, uh, likely to cause severe, serious uh, physical and other effects. So they should, uh, I think, uh, uh, secure more support uh, for states uh, when they are talking about uh, application of uh, rules of sovereignty. That's my view. So it's more a question of fact than law, right? So the, the law the, the law would apply a bit differently to the fa to the fact of an attack against a civ uh, civilian nuclear infrastructure than other types of critical infrastructure because of the severity of harms and because of the, that factual difference. Then maybe states will be driven to to agree uh, uh, on on the applicability of sovereignty in this in this space. Um, thanks, Tomo. So I'm now going to uh, go back to Priya um, and talk a little bit about another important principle of international law that plays out in this in this uh, context, which is the principle of non intervention. So what is the relevance of 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 the principle in this in this context? 
and in particular, could a cross-border cyber operation against a civilian nuclear infrastructure constitute an unlawful intervention, breaching the principle of non-intervention? Priya. Thank you. I think this is um, an interesting question alongside the sovereignty discussions that Tomo was uh, mentioning. Um, and the prohibition on intervention is interesting because states widely agree that such intervention is prohibited, but there is um, a serious lack of disagreement as to what kinds of activities are actually prohibited under the rule. Um, and there are essentially two requirements uh, for intervention to be unlawful, which will equally apply um, in the context of cyber operations um, targeting civilian nuclear infrastructure. Um, the first requirement is that the intervention has to do with or um, has to address the internal or external affairs of a state. Um, and when we think about civilian nuclear infrastructure, which is responsible for generating energy, I think it's quite easy, I would say, to satisfy this requirement and to make the case um, that the intervention does address a matter falling within a state's internal affairs. The second requirement for unlawful intervention is somewhat more tricky because the intervention needs to coerce the targeted state or be coercive um, in order for it to be unlawful. And there seems to be quite a lot of disagreement still as to what actually amounts um, to coercion. Uh, and the general view that's taken is that um, conduct is coercive when it deprives the targeted state of the ability to make a choice or to decide freely uh, with respect to such matters. Um, and I think there's also now an emerging view which could be relevant here, which suggests that if a state deprives another state of uh, its control over the implementation of a policy falling within its internal affairs, um, then that could also be coercive. And I think this is relevant here because um, if a state adopts a policy with respect to the generation of nuclear energy, um, I think this uh, a cyber operation that actually disrupts the production of such energy um, could be coercive and therefore unlawful. Um, but on the other hand, what this implies is that other kinds of cyber operations that involve um, surveillance or data breaches may not be coercive and therefore may not constitute unlawful intervention because they're not actually interrupting uh, the implementation of a state's um, policy. Um, so of course, just to conclude, there's still, there's still a lot of clarity that's uh, needed in the context of um, the prohibition on intervention. But I think tentatively looking at these requirements, it could be that this rule is implicated um, in the context that we're discussing. Thanks, Brian. I think most would agree that nuclear uh, deciding on nuclear policy is part of a state's internal affairs. And so insofar as a, a cyber operation can be seen or deemed as coercive, then the principle would be violated. Now, bearing in mind, and there's a question here in the chat, so someone other than the attacker is to blame. All of this, all of these rules that we are discussing uh, presume that a, the cyber operation in question can be attributed to a state. So we're talking about state responsibility as opposed to the responsibility of individuals. Now, um, I, maybe I should just jump into that question of individual involvement in cyber operations because it has come up in the chat. Uh, and uh, maybe Tom, well, you can talk to us a little bit about the rule of due diligence, which, or the, the principle of due diligence, which precisely addresses this question. When we have a non-state actor that is involved in a cyber operation, and the cyber operation cannot be linked to a state, and then what, it, what are the obligations of states? Uh, what, what does international law have to say when that's the case, when the operation comes from a non-state actor? Tomo. Thank you. Yeah, uh, due diligence, uh, the name of due diligence uh, obligation is probably not uh, very well defined uh, by international law, but uh, when we talk about due diligence obligation, we often uh, think about uh, something uh, which was announced by International Court of Justice in the 1949 Cove Channel case. It was uh, between UK and uh, Albania. And in that uh, uh, judgment, the court uh, mentioned uh, obligation not to allow knowingly uh, the territory to be used for acts contrary to the rights of other states. So this you know, obligation is interesting because uh, it uh, kind of it talks about territorial states' obligation uh, to uh, prevent or mitigate uh, the acts uh, done by the non-state actors inside the territory. But because this uh, uh, unique you know, uh, structure or feature of the obligation, there is um, 
not a clear uh, consensus among states whether this obligation or the principle applies to cyber operations emanating from the territory. And uh, you know, again, <laughs> UK is probably the most uh, skeptical uh, state in this regard again. And the US is also uh, a little bit skeptical about the application of this rule to cyber operations. Japan, uh, Germany, Netherlands are more flexible. Uh, but how this principle should apply, that is not clear yet. But um, in the area of environment uh, law, uh, there is more uh, discussion, uh, advanced discussion going on, like uh, International Law Commission, UN International Law Commission adopted a document called Draft Articles on the Prevention of uh, trans Transboundary Harm from Hazardous Activities in 2002, I think. And this uh, draft article is not binding, and it does not uh, you know, specifically uh, talks about uh, cyber operation. But uh, I think when there is a transboundary harm to the uh, environment, especially, there is more agreement among states that there, is, there should be a due diligence obligation applied to the territorial state. So I think here again, you know, there's no lower threshold for due diligence obligation uh, in the area of uh, nuclear uh, security. But uh, I think it is likelier for state to accept existence of due diligence uh, obligation in the area of uh, transboundary harm, especially caused to uh, environment, I think. Thank you, Tomo. And I can see some questions about negligence uh, of the operator, and I can also see uh, questions about accidents. And the principle that Tomo has been referring to, which is called as a no-harm principle, which addresses transboundary harm, also covers non-intentional. Uh, uh, operations or incidents, so so I, I hope that answers your, your questions. There's also a question here in the chat which is very interesting uh, from Rohana. Is it better to develop generic cybersecurity best practices for nuclear plant operators and employees and, um, and aware them is a must? Is there such a global initiative about cybersecurity best practices for nuclear plant operators? So uh, does anyone want to, to answer that question? Maybe Tarek. And there's also a question, an interesting question about um, prospects for a multilateral agreement on cybersecurity of nuclear facilities. So what do our panelists think? And anyone feel free to jump in. Tomo? Um, may I um, respond to the latter question? Uh, um, no, uh, since I was given uh, this question about the relationship between nuclear security and cyber security, I studied uh, uh, some conventions, and Tariq you know, mentioned the Convention on the protection, Physical Protection of Nuclear Materials, but which was amended in 2005 and covers nuclear facilities as well. And 2005, we didn't uh, discuss cyber security issue uh, in a specific manner. But conceptually, you know, the sabotage, uh, definition of sabotage in this uh, treaty convention could theoretically cover you know, sabotage through uh, cyber attack. So um, I was wondering what, which uh, path we should take. Uh, OEWG and uh, the UN North Species, where states are discussing the general norms. Can we agree on the customary international law rules? Uh, existence of customer international law, uh, law uh, rules uh, under OEWG? Or should we discuss this under IAEA or species, especially with reference to this convention, to uh, apply or uh, interpret uh, this convention uh, to the cyber security uh, issues relating to the nuclear facility? So I think there are several paths, but I think this latter Pass, uh, connected to the existing convention might be easier uh, from my personal point of view. Um, could I come in on that? Yes, absolutely, Tarek. Um, so I would suggest that since um, the IAEA is the internationally designated competent authority to provide regulations for nuclear safety and security and for safeguards, uh, this discussion at one level properly belongs uh, at the IAEA. And I will just list, uh, in response to the previous question, uh, some of the guidance that the IAEA has produced that is available to all uh, member states. And as I mentioned, uh, nuclear security, cybersecurity is considered by states to be a national responsibility still, and they are not willing 
to have an internationally <clears throat> applicable, applicable legal framework, uh, which is mandatory. And this is, I think, this thinking needs to change. But for example, the IAEA has uh, computer security techniques for nuclear facilities guidance, security of information technology for nuclear facilities, implementing guides for security of information technology, uh, also computer security of instrumentation and control systems, and uh, approaches to reduce cyber risks in the nuclear supply chain, uh, plus uh, computer security aspects for design of for instrumentation and control systems at nuclear power plants, also for incident response uh, planning at nuclear facilities, and also for assessments and so on. So there is a lot of, uh, there's a big body of literature and guidance, but it's up to states and the operators. So nuclear facilities have to be licensed. Most nuclear facilities are state owned, but some are also privately owned. So in order to have an operating nuclear reactor or a nuclear facility, the regulator of the state provides a license, which is usually valid for one to three years and has to be renewed uh, uh, constantly. Otherwise, the, uh, the regulator can shut down operations at the nuclear facility. So there is a robust system there, but we need to uh, develop it further to encompass these new and evolving threats from cybersecurity. And my final comment here is there are also liability conventions, the Paris Convention and the Vienna Convention for liability. Although this is covering an accident, but one could also envision that if an operator has been negligent and uh, their facility suffers a cyber-related incident, which causes either nuclear damage or civil damage, who is liable? and who provides compensation to the affected parties? Great, thanks. That's a good question for states to take up in their um, negotiations about, about future conventions on the topic then. Priya, I know you want to, to, to comment on that as well, and then we were running out of time, so we only have three to four minutes, and then I want to end the session with a survey for, for everyone. Priya? Thanks, yeah, I'll be quite brief, but I just wanted to highlight um, the importance, I think, of getting at the problem from different angles. And I think Tomo put it quite well too. Um, you know, on the one hand, we need to take certain preventative measures uh, of cybersecurity, uh, which Michael mentioned as well. Um, but we also, when incidents occur, need to be able to address them uh, and address questions of legal accountability as well. And I think it probably remains to be seen how useful it will be to apply general rules of international law in this context and also to admit where those general rules might not apply and where there may be a need for some sort of further regulation. And whether um, that actually happens is, as Tariq mentioned, up to states at the end of the day to decide that um, they want to implement um, certain um, measures or not. Um, so I'll just, yeah, end it there, thanks. Thanks, Priya. So to end the session, and thanks once again to our brilliant panelists, we have a question for you uh, in the audience, online and, and in person. So in light of everything that we have just discussed, the risks, the initiatives, the, the approaches that have been developed, mm. Rowan? Yeah, we wanted to ask you, so what else should states, private companies, and all the other stakeholders that we've discussed today um, be doing to address the cyber nuclear risks? So we'll give just a couple of minutes um, Okay, so let's see what you have responded to this survey. What do you think we should be doing next? Okay, so uh, I think everyone, I uh, think the, the, the highest um, priority here, Rowan, is 
Yeah, we've got um, better, oh, we've got modernized the cybersecurity and um, civilian nuclear infrastructure that scored a, a oh, moving. Three, it's uh, still uh, moving, 9.1. Yeah. <laughs> 9.1. <laughs> I um, guess, yeah. Yeah, and then coming in at second, we've got um, to better understand um, the threat landscape. Um, currently, 8.6. Yeah, so I guess that's what Marion uh, sort of like uh, spoke to us about at the beginning. We need we need to better understand the threats, so both the cyber attacks that are out there and the types of cyber attacks that are out there, accidents that might happen as well but also the consequences of those those harms. And uh, we also need to um, hear improved dialogue between the cyber and nuclear sectors. I think that's an important uh, um, step forward. Uh, and now, on, on law, do we need uh, cyber specific, uh, nu cyber nuclear specific norms, uh, rules or best practices? That got a 6.4, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe we should stick to what we already have. <laughs> Okay, uh, everyone, thanks uh, so much for joining us today for this panel. Thanks to our speakers. Thanks to your involvement. Thanks to your answers to the survey. It was a real pleasure uh, to be with you today. If you want to know more about our work, just um, go on our website. Uh, we also post uh, things regularly on Twitter. Just follow our work, our, the work of our panelists. And uh, yes, we will keep you informed about future developments that we are doing in this space. Thanks everyone again Thank and um, bye. Greetings from, from Kyoto, bye. <laughs>